is Sunday, October 18th, 2020. Meet the CFA, Dr. Kathy Carroll. This is the 39.6 Facebook and YouTube Live Finance Show, the show that teaches high earners like yourselves how to make your money work for you so you don't have to work for your money. We talk general investing, taxes, real estate, syndications, Airbnb, paying for childcare, pay for college, and even the car you drive. Today, we have a very, very, very special guest, Dr. Kathy Carroll of RICA, internal medicine hospitalist, and a certified oh, a CFA. I'll let her go into the details on this. She and I are working together on our Element 41 syndication and running our sub fund together. With no further ado, and thank you everybody for joining us. Here's Kathy. There you go. All right. If somebody from the audience can let me know if you can see both me and Kathy, and if we're both coming through, that would be fantastic. Okay. So, Kathy. Hi. All right. Thank Hi, you Kathy. Me. Okay, good. All the audio and all the video, I think, are working. I wanted to put your name up on the screen and I, okay, I can see both of you. Okay. I don't know how to do that here. Maybe I'll figure it out in, in a minute. Okay. So welcome, Kathy. You're coming to us live from San Diego, San, San Diego, San Diego, mm -hmm. uh, San Diego. That's, city. <laughs> That's Anchorman city, right? <laughs> exactly. It is. Yes. All right. Um, okay. So Kathy is a CFA and working with us on uh, Element 41. Kathy, can you please explain to our users what a CFA is? For our I am a chartered financial analyst. Chartered. Um, everybody thinks it's certified. Yes, chartered yeah, financial chartered. analyst and CFA. Yes. So I am not a CPA. I'm not an accountant. And I am not a CFP. I'm not a financial planner. So the Chartered Financial Analyst, it's all geared at analyzing securities, in particular stocks, although it does deal with other stuff too. So if you want somebody to say, take Goldman Sachs and figure out all their revenue streams and expenses and project them forward 50 years and then discount it back to the stock price, that's what most CFAs wind up doing. Okay. so. Now, in terms of all the financial space, there's a lot of different financial professionals out there. How common are CFAs? To be honest with you, I only know, like personally, one other CFA, like that I actually mm -hmm. know. They're pretty infrequent as the, the training and the testing, from my understanding, is, is quite arduous. Is it, would that, would that be small. That's, okay. that's and, oh. most, most people are either CFPs, financial planners, or CPAs, which is the accounting side. Okay. Now, people who are CFAs, how does that training compare to others, for example? Uh, it is a three years of testing. It used to be you could only take one test per year, and if you failed, you failed. You just had to wait till the next year. So you take one part of the three-part series each year. And then after you pass those parts, in order to become a chartered financial analyst, you still need to have 4,000 hours of industry experience. And it has to be specifically in certain things, basically analytical things like 4, analyzing hours. And bonds. So yes. 4,000 hours. So that's working full time, 40 hours a week ish. Okay. Times For two a couple years. years. Right. Okay. And you need to pass three, it's like three separate exams, one exam per year for three years. Exactly. Are those like the series 65, series seven, or are these different things? Uh, totally different. So the series allow you to basically sell investments. Okay. And CFA has zero to do with sales. Okay. It's, it's pure analysis. Okay. Uh, the series tests, I haven't taken them, but I'm told they're a little bit easier than the CFA, but I haven't taken them, so I can't really say. Okay. Now, um, so you finished college, first of all, what was your initial training in? 
when you know in your uh, study so, in yes. college. And I was where, an economics where? major. Okay. Uh, out in Smith, in, like, which is in Northampton, Massachusetts. Degrees. Yes. <laughs> okay, and you went to where? Uh, Smith College in Massachusetts. Okay, Smith. And speaking of uh, Massachusetts and Halloween, um, where where are where are the Salem where is Salem compared to Smith? Salem is far away from Smith. Salem oh. is about two hours east of that. It's um, kind of on the coast in the no north of Boston. Okay. And Smith is all the way on the west part of Massachusetts. Smith is in the very snowy part of Western Massachusetts as you're heading towards New York. Okay. So you're, you basically border the upstate New York, right? Yes. Headed that way. Okay. Okay. So you, you get an econ degree, you and like two other mm -hmm. classmates from college mm -hmm. and yeah. out of college, you decide I am going to be a CFA. What happens? Mm -hmm. Uh, almost. Well, out of college, I was going to move to New York and take a job with Morgan Stanley. Okay. But as as it happened, I met this guy uh, who did not want to go. So to a guy who didn't go to college with you, because for those listeners, guy, I, that's, yes, that's really Smith is women's college. It does not. He went to uh, UMass Amherst, and uh -huh. he wasn't real excited about the Big Apple. Okay. He's a Boston boy. Okay. Uh, spoiler alert: We got married, so that that worked out. In the end. Right. It's not a different guy you're talking about. No, no, no. Same guy. <laughs> same guy. As far as he knows. As far as he knows, it's the same guy. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully he's not listening. He's probably not. Uh, but yes, same guy. So he wanted to stay in the okay. Boston area. So I gave up on the Morgan Stanley investment banking job and so moved out to which, Boston. You know, um, Bonnie Koo, actually, I think out of undergrad, she got her first job at Morgan Stanley in New York. Oh, okay. So she mm -hmm. got started before she went back to medical school. And mm -hmm. the main dermatologist, from, from what mm -hmm. I recall, but I'm not sure on the deal, but I think it was Morgan Stanley she worked for. So if you mm -hmm. had gone to Morgan Stanley, what kind of work would you have been doing with them? Uh, that would have been investment banking. So like, I would have been on what's called the, the sell side, which is when you're doing analysis, but with the goal of analyzing something and then pitching it to somebody else to try to get them to buy it. I went the other way. I eventually went to work for the asset management side, which is the buy side, meaning I'm doing analysis, but it's for our own private use to mm -hmm. determine what we should buy in our portfolio. Okay, right. So like investment banking, that's like the whole iBanking world, right? That, right. Okay, so you're on the other side of it. You're like on the brain side of this. Yes, okay. So on the other side. Okay, so you go over to Boston and mm -hmm. um, you start off your career working toward the CFA track? I started off doing mutual fund accounting, which is like the most horrible thing in the world. Okay, what does that it's mean? Like the a a mutual, for a mutual fund? Is that like keeping track of all the, the, all the things you have to buy and sell within the fund or? It's all the trades that go Every on trade? in the fund, the eight bazillion trades. Now a lot of it's computerized, right? right? But it's still back. This was, this was, I'm, I'm old. I have a lot of gray hair. This was a long you time ago, that? right? <laughs> um, it, we had the internet, but I actually had an electric typewriter in college with, with these little specialized disks to put it in perspective. Oh man. And, and the internet, we had AOL disks. I don't know. You're probably too young. Oh, I, know. I had AOL, AOL disks. I still yeah, remember my yeah. AOL login. Yeah. So th this was in the dial up days. Right. Right. This was back in the Wolf of Wall Street days. Mm. So a long time ago. So all those trades have to be reconciled, all the money in, all the money out. So it's like the equivalent of being an intern in finance. It's truly horrible. So uh, did they have quant quant trading in those days still, or is that something more new? No, quant jocks existed then. They'll always be quant jocks. Okay. Don't so like, there were massive, very rapid trades that were happening. Yes. Yes. Okay. So it was a horrible job. And a lot of people start off in that horrible job because economics is a two-ply polyabsorbent degree, <laughs> as every econ major <laughs> finds out once they graduate. So it was immediately obvious I needed a better plan. Uh, and that's when I started to study for the CFA. Okay, but those hours counted toward the 4,000 hours, right? Um, actually, I don't think the accounting hours did. Uh, the stuff that I did later, because it has to not just be working in investments, it's gotta be certain kinds of work. Okay, so as an accountant, you weren't actually trained as an accountant, right? But they trained yeah. you to do this particular type of work they wanted exactly. to do. I can do that one type of accounting. Okay. <laughs> that very painful type of accounting. Okay. Which was an excellent motivator to move on. All right. Okay. Uh, well, the compensation was reasonable though? No, not at all. 
<laughs> mutual fund accountants are like are like the beta testers of the video game world. Oh, it's it's just what you do to get in. Okay. So it's terrible pay and terrible hours and, okay. and mind numbing work, but you get really good with details. Yeah, yeah. No, you are very good at details. Okay, and you never like studied engineering, right? No, yeah. but my father and my brother are engineers actually. Okay. Okay. I probably would have been an engineer if I hadn't gone into finance. Uh, okay. Did they have engineering at Smith out of curiosity? They had just started engineering there, but only in its most nascent form. So not right. really, no. Yeah, a lot of liberal arts colleges don't have engineering programs. It just logistically, no. I don't think it, it works for a lot it's, of places. It's like the most liberal of the liberal arts colleges, so no. <laughs> okay. So you, 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 you're doing accounting. You're like, okay, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm doing something else. Right. Mm -hmm. Once you had a job right out of out of school, a lot of people. I had a job. Yeah, I mean, when I graduated from college, it was not a great time economically. Um, it was funny because when I started college, it was ninety nine. I remember mm -hmm. going there and visiting, and when I was studying biomedical engineering, I was talking to the other people in biomedical engineering, and the seniors graduating were like, "I have five offers on my desk," right? Because this is like boom tech boom, and they just mm -hmm. there was so much rapid growth, and they had. And then when I graduated in 2003 with an engineering degree, no job. <laughs> they were, Another world. They yeah, had, they hired a bunch of people and they were still holding on to them and not making any money. So, all right. So you decide now to do the CFA track. Do you continue working there while you're doing this, uh, while you're studying and taking all these tests? Uh, yes, I kept I kept working there because I had to eat. So I, I, I moved on from being a mutual fund accountant to like the head mutual fund type accountant, right? Uh -huh. And then eventually I finished the CFA and somewhere in there, I went back and got a master's in finance too. Um, but then well, that's when I started working for an asset manager. Um, no, I did. I did quit at one okay. point to do the master's faster because I wanted to do it in a year and it was just going to take too long All right. time. So where did you get your that master's? Was, that was grad school number one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. This so is my master's is from, this is in Boston in uh, Waltham actually at Bentley University. So I have okay. a master's in finance from there. Okay. So that's a MF? Uh, MS in finance. MS in Techni finance. Technically global financial analysis, which sounds much fancier. Okay. Now did that have, did that actually help you regarding the CFA training or was that really completely tangential? No, it was very helpful because there was a lot of overlap. That was much mm -hmm. more about like global economics. Um, but also uh, a good deal about how you actually trade. They actually had a, a mock trading floor at Bentley okay. uh, long before other people did that. So it was a really good prep for the later phases of the CFA. Okay. All right. So then you go back to, then you go back to the same, like a different company that you're not the same one you're working at before after you get your MFA. Mm -hmm. Okay. What no. are you doing in this new place? So then I finally, you know, I had my CFA, I had my master's. So I was working at a company called uh, Loomis Sales. So they do asset management for private pension funds and for big companies. Okay, so asset management for big, so that means like these are people who are hired by the companies mm -hmm. who have the pension plans. And right, so if you're, if you're a big company, you don't necessarily wanna go to Vanguard and right. say manage our money. You're going to a private asset management firm and saying manage our money. Right, you come to me. We don't come mm -hmm. to you, but I'll hire you. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Got it. So then, then you're actually, now you're managing gigantic assets, right? Now, now I'm finally doing something fun, right? Okay. So now, not, now it's my job. That, for mutual fund trades. No, God, <laughs> no. Um, so now I'm finally doing something I like. So my, my specialty was to analyze a certain world of stocks right, a certain universe. So my specialty was actually to analyze the other asset managers, the investment bankers, all the money stocks on Wall Street. It was my job to know those and try to you predict their know, stock like prices. Case. You didn't know Goldman, you didn't know like right. Fidelity or? Uh, Fidelity wasn't, well, Fidelity is not public, but all of, right. anything that was publicly right. publicly traded. Right, yeah. right, okay. Okay, but yeah. so any anybody in the finance industry Mm -hmm. you are overseeing understanding all of their books. So you can yes. see if they're undervalued, overvalued, what their projections look like. You exactly. would basically come up with that stuff de novo yourself, right? You would take the right. information at hand and say, oh, this is something that will work for this, 
and not work mm -hmm. for that. For right. So I'd be going into into Edgar, which is the SEC database with my dial up modem, right? Because it's a long time ago. And downloading, you know, their their 10Ks and all their financial data and then putting that into my huge massive Excel model mm -hmm. to try to model out what I think will happen to them in the future. Right. Forward looking. Forward looking. And then from that you have to discount it back to try to figure out what the stock price should, to be. should be. Right. Which right. It, it never matches because so much of the stock market is emotional, but oh, it yeah. gives you a range. Yes. Yeah. And then there's like momentum and all these other factors that weigh into mm -hmm. pricing, which a lot of people out there are still buying things, not based on any fundamentals. Right. right. But you're looking long term so that you can get a good idea of what it really projects you. But of course, the, the, you know, the back calculation to the current price is always going to be very noisy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so this company you're working for, the, but the, the funds they're managing are how big? Uh, are the total uh, assets under management back then was sixty yeah. billion. I it's don't like know what it is now. Total. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's just pretend that they were to take, if it was a, a whole one percent of sixty billion, mm -hmm. six hundred million dollars. If it were like mm -hmm. half a percent, that would then be. $300 million per year, if it was mm -hmm. taking like 50 basis points? Uh, something like that. Yeah, so there's a lot, yeah. there's a lot of money here. There's a lot of money. It, so it actually, it sounds like a lot of money, but uh, it, that's a relatively small asset manager for the type of asset manager that we were. Okay, all right, because some pensions are billions of dollars. Exactly. All right, so if you had how many 60 billion in all mm -hmm. of your funds then yeah i guess i mean there's probably some pensions out there that are 60 billion dollars by themselves exactly right. so we manage pension funds for a lot of unions and things like that in new england okay now um so that space if you were advising on your company to take a fund or if you found something some mismatch in valuation and you said, you know, mm -hmm. we should sell something and buy something else in replace. Mm -hmm. How big are these orders you guys are doing though? Because you're basically making or influencing a decision for mm -hmm. a buy and sell of what order of magnitude? Um, it depends on the funds. You know, some of the funds were relatively small and some of them were quite large. So the trades could be in the hundreds of thousands, but they could be in, you know, if it's if it's a huge rebalancing. It could be in the tens of millions, but it just depends on the fund. Okay, so when you mentioned rebalancing, so is it typical in that space to rebalance pension fund on a like a quarterly or annual basis? It's continuous. It's okay, really just based on what, what you're seeing. Are just always rebalancing toward like a goal asset allocation. Mm, it's not necessarily just the goal asset allocation because this is active management, right? This is right. not Vanguard. You are trying to beat the market. So, right. so you, you and a portfolio it. manager, you're always trying to do better. So you're saying, well, hey, if we're going into a down economy, how much do we want to have in consumer durables and utilities? Uh, how much do we want to have in the tech companies? So they're constantly rebalancing their sectors. And then within mm -hmm. the sectors, you're yeah. always repositioning. So there's a lot of trading. Okay. Okay. And that could be like every single day based on any information that's available. It and could be every day. It could be um, once a week. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And they don't have to worry about um, like capital gains inside these funds because within a pension you can trade. Exactly. You can trade as much as you want. Right. Okay. All right. So that sounds a lot more exciting than counting, um, reconciling mutual fund accounts on a daily it basis. Was. <laughs> okay. So that's great. And you're a CFA, you're like at the top mm -hmm. of your field, um, right? Mm -hmm. Above a CFA in this space, is, is there something above training wise or testing wise? No, not right. that I can think of. Okay. Some people go on to get an MBA, but a lot of people consider that you only need one. It's either right. or. Okay. Okay. So you do this and then you do this like for six years or so? Mm -hmm. the, six years. Or yeah. Phase, or a little less than that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Ah, active management. Oh, look, look, we have the, yes. Yeah. The, it's, it's like a bad word in some places. Um, mm -hmm. but it's interesting. 
in a pension fund, this is actually one of the most useful places for active management, um, at least in my opinion. I can discuss this another day. But there are a lot of parameters in a pension fund. Um, for example, wanting to preserve capital, um, holding on to just having an asset allocation for the long haul may be great for the long haul for an individual. But when you have a pension and you have to keep things above zero every year, year in, year out, and have money going in and going out, there are different things you need to take into consideration. Um, back to you. Um, okay, so back to our, what we were discussing. You're, you're, you're managing all this money, and then you, you get bored with this, and you get bored of the East Coast. Uh, well, in part, yes. That's a whole other story, but yes, decided to change. Okay, all right. Um, so you got out of the space, and you moved to California, because that's yes. what people do. Yes, I came home one day and informed my husband I was not happy, and I was never gonna be happy there, and I wanted to move the end. Uh, and he from? had because you were, you I'm were from North, I'm from North, North Carolina. Carolina. So it sounds like you know what it's like to live out there. Yes, I, I'm from North Carolina. So the whole concept of weather was very new to me. Ah, okay. What part of North Carolina? Uh, Apex, North Carolina. It's in the Research Triangle Park. RTP. Yes. So yeah. I'm a dookie. So, I, well, I didn't know that about you. Ah, this that's, hasn't actually that's come unfortunate. Up. You didn't go to Carolina, though, but you probably oh, have a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, everybody either goes to UNC or NC State. Those are your two choices. Yeah, we don't we don't like the Duke kids. Sorry. Yeah, because yeah, we're the we're like the invaders, right? I'll try to forget that about you. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. So you went all the way to Smith, and you had Duke down the street. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. All right. But yeah, the the weather actually in North Carolina was one of the number one things that I liked about mm -hmm. going to Duke. They, I, I remember like reading the brochure. They're like, we have like a hundred ninety sunny days per year. And like the weather's perfect there. Like, you know, they get one month of winter, which is all you need. Mm -hmm. um, right. You have, and like, it's an unimpressive winter. Right. You get like a snowflake um, mm -hmm. and once. So you can see that in January. And otherwise, the entire school year is just like perfect weather. So mm -hmm. it's fantastic. Um, and then yeah. I moved to Boston. Yeah, I miss North Carolina. I did. I did like Boston, but I wanted to move somewhere somewhere warmer. And then I get now I'm in Texas where it's. It was 90 mm -hmm. degrees today, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you get to California and um, you, you do a stint in, <laughs> in subprime. It's a legit field. It is, it is. Subprime auto loans, yes. Subprime I was, I was the loan. analysis, yes. Right, you so were. I was doing the analysis to try to figure out um, kind, of the, kind of the risk side of it, right? What do you charge in order to make these things work okay so and, because loans are bonds right so like it's, it's a loan can default and you basically exactly you could lose everything but granted you could likely to be able to repossess a car hopefully but it might not be in good shape so you should get some mm -hmm. residual value back if you if you foreclose on that car but still you can mm -hmm. lose a lot of money in anybody who doesn't right. so mm -hmm. it only takes so many people to not pay for a fund of these loans to like blow up the fund, which is what happened in the subprime mortgage crisis. They were all like yes. way overrated. They're like, oh, we diversify this over like a thousand bonds, a thousand mortgages, mm -hmm. but they're all garbage. Um, and mm -hmm. it only takes like three of them to default to blow the whole thing up. Um, so you're in a similar space, but was this around the same period of time? Oh uh, yeah, and it was, it was pretty obvious after I took the job that it was gonna blow up and it did, and they went under. So that's about the time I decided to look into med school, which my, you know, I I watched family member go through it, and I thought she was nuts. But having been through a couple stock market crashes and 9/11 and subprime auto loans, it no longer seemed so unreasonable. Right. Yeah. You know, being in medicine, a lot of people think that's like bond-like income. Actually, it was funny because. Mm -hmm. At White Coat Investors meeting in March, I forget who it was, a famous person was talking about how, you know, as a doctor, somebody asked about asset allocation, said, as a doctor, you have one of the most bond-like incomes there is. I would be very heavily, toward, heavily weighted toward equities because your income is like a bond. Well, mm -hmm. that was like- 
That was that was in the before times. It was, was like before literally before. the market had crashed like eleven percent that day. <laughs> that was yeah. like that was like the biggest crash we had in like a hundred years. Um, mm -hmm. But he's like, yeah, I would just be, you know, I'm still very bullish on equities, and I would still. I'm probably misquoting this, and someone might get upset with me. But yeah, like this was like right as you know the world is coming to a halt. Then lo and behold, all doctors like compensation just went down. Um, or at least mm -hmm. help your dollars did whether or not your paycheck did. But if your paycheck like and your salary did not go down, I kind of worry that maybe you've been underpaid <laughs> a lot for a long time because if they hadn't had to take it down now, then they must've had like a bunch of padding on your salary beforehand mm -hmm. to think about. Um, because most all doctors who actually get paid what they bring in took some sort of a cut this year you know, one way or another. Okay. So you decided to go to med school. Where did you end up going? UC Davis. Okay. So you in go Sacramento. to Davis and you decided to be an internal medicine physician. And where did you go mm -hmm. right after that? Santa Clara Valley in San Jose. Okay. So then now like you went from East coast, now you're West coast and you're sticking to it. Now I'm West coast and I'm sticking to it. I would not go back. <laughs> but you, you grew up East coast, but that's like, at, like at le South East coast or. Yes. Do you consider North Carolina South, by the way? Uh, it is It is considered the South. I feel more like an East Coaster because I lived in Boston for so long. Uh -huh. And it's it's painfully obvious when you move to the West Coast who is an East Coaster and who is a West Coaster. You can still spot them coming a mile away. So I identify more as an East Coaster, although I do eat avocado toast now from time to time. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so real estate-wise, mm -hmm. how did we get to where we are Um with all, so you you have a, a, a reasonable portfolio, right? How mm -hmm. did you get started in real estate? So meanwhile, back at the ranch. Yeah. So back in 2001, when I married that guy that mm -hmm. I met out at, at UMass, you know, we had we had no money. We had just graduated. I was in the glamorous world of funding. We were totally broke. Right. So we had a grand total between the two of us of 8,000 bucks. Nice. And that was after we sold our CDs like like the round things that you put in to make music, you're, you're not, not a certificate of deposit. You're going to the pawn we shop. We sold our music. No, we did. We, went, we took it to like the used CD places, right. which no longer exist. So nice. we scraped together well, we eight grand. Had value. We did. We did. We still got something from them. Yeah. They, I think they went for like two bucks each, which was pretty good. Right. Anyway, so I have eight grand. We want a house. We have no money. We have these little W-2 jobs so we can get a loan. Uh, so we bought a house from a friend of the family. We bought it off market. I didn't know what off market was. And it was a duplex. Okay. And we decided we would, we would house hack it. Although I don't think that was a word because I don't think right. bigger pockets existed yet. Yeah. This is so it was, yeah, that's just, so this was a long time ago. Duplex. How old is this property? Because this is, you're talking about, years you're talking about Boston. There's really old property yeah. in Boston. 100 year old duplex. Yeah. The pillars were cedar, were cedar trunks with bark on them. And it was like this big stone foundation. It's knob and tube wiring. It's 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 everything bad. Hey, hey world, that you would not want. Mention, this is not your first. This is not the ideal. You should not job. do this. <laughs> no, this should not be your first thing. My wife and I went down this street in Dallas yesterday called Swiss Avenue. Um, has it's the historic district, and I'm like, these are hundred year old houses, and we're just thinking about the unbelievable headaches that. Mm -hmm. It, they would be like, you would just have to have like your own staff, like on speed dial, because mm -hmm. you're always going to have something being fixed. <laughs> yep. Right. That's what we did. Okay. So but we spent two years know, living in it and renovating money. it. Tell me how much was this property that you got for eight grand? Uh, I think we paid like a hundred and sixty, hundred seventy thousand dollars for this complex. This is in Woburn, which is a suburb of Boston. Okay. That still sounds like a pretty if, inexpensive place. Uh, yeah, because there was like water pouring through the floor from the second story and the main sewer that pipe was, was That's cracked. a kind of water feature. Yeah. And, and the floor went like this. So we had to jack the whole foundation. So it was indeed a steal because <laughs> nobody else wanted this thing. Well, you did get it off market. So this could have been actually a We got it off market. If they actually- it could have been. It could have been. We, I mean, in fact, we bought it from a friend of the family that was a physician. Yeah. And were they, this, this is one of their investment properties, I'm assuming. This was an investment property. And again, I hadn't thought anything about med school. It was a living the family. 
Oh no, yeah, we, we lived in this dorm. But you were, but the physician was not living in there. You bought no, it No, the physician was not, rental. he lived far away, yeah. Okay, so you bought this 100 year old property and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that the land now is worth well in excess of this. Oh yeah. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, if you held on to it, you could actually have done well overall, overall. But so you buy mm -hmm. a, a duplex, you live in one side, they were mm -hmm. tenants in them, uh, in the other side yep. already, one of them became vacant. Came you moved with in? tenants. Okay. Yeah, came with tenants. One part was vacant, so we moved into that part and we renovated the whole thing while we lived in it. Yeah, live in live in house hack. It's not good. Okay. Maybe that was good. Did, did they have the five hundred thousand dollar exclusion rule back then? You know, for they probably did. They there was an exclusion, um, but because half of it we didn't live in, that part was right. not excluded. Right. Oh, uh, okay. So we did so wind up paying some taxes. And you would get, okay, so only half of the gains could be attributed to that exclusion. So for those exactly. who don't know, if you live in a house for two years out of the past five and you're married and you, fi marry, and you file married filing jointly, I believe you have to do that too. Mm -hmm. Then you take capital gains of up to $500,000 at a tax rate of 0%. So, um, okay, so because you, you, cause you're putting money into this and you're making it nicer. And you were an mm -hmm. accountant. Did you actually keep track of all the dollars you spent in like all your, because most people don't think about this when they get their first property. I didn't think about it. And then I was mm -hmm. like, I, I converted it to a rental and I was like, oh, what's my basis? How many dollars mm -hmm. did I put into my property the past five years I've owned this place? Um, oh did yeah, you, were you I had all the receipts. You had all the receipts? Every single Home Depot and Lowe's. Lowe's was new. Back then, we had just piles and piles and piles oh of little people. Okay. So this is the kind of person you want managing your money. She is yeah. that. <laughs> that I'm that anal. She actually, at the beginning, with her first duplex, and she's like 22 years old, kept every single mm -hmm. receipt of all of their. We have to keep the receipts. How do you do it without the receipts? Because you don't. Is that even a thing? Most people don't think about what their cost basis is mm -hmm. because you're just living there, right? Yeah. And I mean, because of the exclusion, it doesn't really matter to most people. But if, I mean, if you made a ton of money, then that increased cost basis can definitely help. Um, but especially if you're renting out the other side, though, a lot of the mm -hmm. renovations you're doing are probably also helping out the, the house as a, the duplex as a whole, right? So you can actually expense right. a lot of that stuff. Okay, so you have this duplex, you're living in it. How, how big is this place? Mm, it's probably like 3,500 square feet. Oh, both sides together. Okay. So it that's was a pretty big duplex. A good size. In Boston, that's a good size. Oh yeah. Yeah. And there's a little bit of an echo. I don't know if, uh, if I don't know if you can turn down, uh, maybe a little bit more on your side. Does that help? Yeah. A lot. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You can still hear me. I can still hear you. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so. You have this duplex about 1800 square feet on each side. This is like a two bedroom, two bath on each side. Uh, it was a, yeah, two, one top and bottom. Two, one. Okay. All right. Two, one upper and a lower. Yeah. Okay. Which one were you on? The bottom. Okay. So you got to have the feet walking on top of you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, how long did you stay at this place? Two years. And okay. Let's like, walk me through the, the, the renovations and then the repairs. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, it was pretty much all renovations. So first we had to stop the water that would pour <laughs> in to the first floor from the second floor whenever the tenants took a shower. Uh -huh. So all their shower water would just pour down into our side. So that was the first thing we had to fix. Uh, okay. And then I went to get something from underneath the kitchen sink one day and my hand brushed the plumbing and all of the plumbing just fell. It just disintegrated. So that was the second repair. And then the whole so house had to be repaired out of curiosity. So we went to Home Depot and we bought a book. I kid you not, we still have it called How to Do Plumbing Repairs. Oh my God. Okay. This is fantastic. So we're in there with like You're with like a wrench home. and plumber's putty, and we don't know what it is and we don't know how to use it. And we're like just figuring it out. My husband to this day refuses to do plumbing. And I actually yeah. learned some new words that I did not know in this no. process. He had to explain to me, I cannot say them, this is a family friendly show, 
but I learned he taught me new curse words. Yeah. No, you know, I think yeah. a lot of us go through this like, same, same experience with our first rental and like, we're like, oh, I can mm-hmm. do it. You know, how hard could it really be? And really hard. before like YouTube was like big, cause now you can still find, you can find most everything on YouTube, but still. No YouTube dial up. This is dial up days. Oh. There are things no, you know, I, I remember no being from like Home Depot, like the three, two, one, like home repair manual thing for like my yep. condo. And oh my gosh, plumbing, it still drives me plumbing, absolutely so insane. Like yeah. sometimes the most basic thing, like I just changed out, like just pu- changing out the like the the va- the valve inside the toilet. Mm-hmm. Like you you should be able to do it like a minute, like just like leaving the bottom part on. Plumbing. Never, it never works that way. No, it doesn't happen. It oh, it's always like an hour and two trips to the hardware store, right? And Minimum. oh, and then like you know the water goes everywhere. And the problem is, like stepwise, it's so simple. But gosh, mm-hmm. water is the most unforgiving thing. It you, just the smallest leak, boom, you're done. It has mm-hmm. to have like no leak. So it drives me nuts. Oh yeah, we we no. learned this. So, so you learned. <laughs> We learned, we, we went, we gutted the whole first floor. We ripped out the knob and tube wiring. We jacked up the foundation because we had to remove the cedar trees because the bottom two inches of the cedar logs, which were the beams of the house was rotting because they were in contact with the basement floor, which was just dirt. So there was a basement here? Like, mm-hmm. did you, guys have you have to have a basement in New England. You have to, or the whole house because the, the ground freezes. So we had to remove the cedar logs and replace them with actual beams and jack up the whole house. With people living in it. With us living in, in it. it. I mean, and then the we jacked part. it up too much and I got stuck. My dad and my husband were downstairs doing the jacking and I was upstairs in the living room. Wait, and you I got doing the foundation yourself? Mm-hmm. You didn't have engineers doing this? Like, like, like. My dad's an engineer. Oh. He's a nuclear engineer. That's close oh. oh my God. Okay. So there are a few things that I just would absolutely not do. Like absolutely. No, you should that- not do any of these things. This, this is like a what not to do, but I got stuck because they jacked it up too much and all the doors jammed shut and I couldn't get out. So then I had to unjack the house or else I was going to have to climb out the window. So yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do any of these things. So weren't they afraid that this might like collapse on them underneath the house? No, it probably should have been. My husband almost died because one of the things they were using to jack, it like actually snapped in half and went flying. Yeah. You Jacking do this. That is like Don't one try this thing. at home. I feel like you should have a little thing at the bottom of the screen. Don't try this at home. Never do this. Ever. <laughs> Never do this. Never. But it all okay. worked out in the end. I mean, fixing like a patch in the floor, I was with you on that. And a leak. Yeah. But okay. A foundation no. repair. There's no patching. Right. <laughs> There was no patching at all. I would have killed for a patch. Oh my gosh. Okay. How about the roof? Did you have to redo the roof? Actually, the roof was okay, believe it or not. Oh, okay. Maybe it was like less than 15 years old. What are and, the odds? Uh, the water, hot water, cold water, like the water heater, air conditioning. Oh yeah. I mean, oh, all of that. Ace, there's no air conditioning. This is New England. You just sweat. See, no my wife does not understand this. Like, mm-hmm. I grew up in Michigan, right? I never had air conditioning growing up. They're like, mm-hmm. but it never gets hot. No, it does get hot. Not like it does mm-hmm. here, but there's like, we still have a summer and it's like amazing summer and it gets mm-hmm. over hundred degrees in parts of the summer. Yeah. I, I didn't have air conditioning until I went to college, but mm-hmm. we lived in an old Tudor house and it had steamed heat and you didn't have duct work to do yeah. air conditioning. So if you had exactly. air, like, you got a window unit, but we had leaded glass windows and you couldn't really mm-hmm. fit air conditioning things in these windows. So you have to like change the whole thing out and it just didn't happen. So, yeah. okay. New, New Englanders have a long tradition of suffering. This is, this is part of their culture. Yeah. Oh, well, so I mean, there's no, you're... there's no air conditioning. You just right. sweat. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. If you go to like to Airbnb and in, in Europe, a lot of places, there's no air conditioning because they just don't have air conditioning. Right. And mm-hmm. like, it'll make a big deal if they have it. Like you'll go like walk three flights of stairs up to your room in like France and then find out there's no air conditioning after you brought all your luggage up three flights. And that's just normal there. Um, mm-hmm. It's not like uh, you, you mention if you do have it, but you don't have to naturally mention that you don't because nobody does, right? They're 200 year old properties. They didn't have air conditioning. Exactly. So, okay. 
So you didn't have to worry about air conditioning because it didn't have air conditioning. Roof held up. You stay there for, what, what was the rent, by the way? Uh, I think the upstairs was running for like 14 or 1500. Okay. And you bought this for like $160,000. So, yeah, so it paid, I mean, we pretty much paid our mortgage. I don't remember what the interest rate was anymore. Free. Yeah. Basically, you weren't leaving for free. You were working your tail off. So, <laughs> Aside from the thousands of dollars I spent at Home Depot on those every month, it right. was free to live in. <laughs> Apart from that, it was free. Besides all the sweat, money, uh, and effort. Yeah. Yes. Once you got everything fixed, then yeah, that's actually, it's pretty challenging as a duplex to live for free these days mm -hmm. in prices. Just because the price to buy the versus the price to rent ratios are not usually favorable enough. The fourplex, definitely, but a duplex mm -hmm. is pretty tough. Um, so you held out to for two years. Did you stay living in it for both two years that you were there? Yeah. Well, two years is how long it took to fix. And the second the paint was dry, I said, I am done. And we are selling and we are going to California. I am done. <laughs> so that was the last time you bought a hundred year old uh, New England house. Never again. Never again. <laughs> You earned like a badge. You get, you but we made a bunch of money. And that's that's what got us started in real estate. At that point when you moved to California? Mm -hmm. No, we made $175,000 on it. Wow. In two years? In two years. Some of which was dumb luck, right? Right. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Well, part and of that was the market in Boston had just exploded. Forced right. appreciation. It was a duplex at a time. Duplexes were very popular because... People were starting to learn about this real estate thing. There was this guy with this rich dad, poor dad book yeah. that was getting really popular, right? And then mm -hmm. meanwhile, the Boston market had just popped. So yeah. some of it was just good luck. Right. I mean, you you uh, you you got it off market, so you probably got it at a good price right. at the first place. You got it really cheap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you put in a lot of money and effort. And I mean, even at the same market value, you probably still would have come out well ahead. But then you also mm -hmm. got the third bump by actually having market appreciation, which Correct. that part is luck. Um, mm -hmm. So you did very well. And then people will say, well, mm -hmm. what's the cash on cash return? Well, yeah, it's like 20X, but you put in a lot of money. How much do you think you put into it in cash in all your rehab, like 20,000? In cash, because we hired someone to do the kitchen, I'd say we probably put in like 35,000 over the two years. Okay. So you redid the whole good. kitchen in your, in your unit? Yeah. And for that, we did hire somebody because we were yeah. very tired at that point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you and just did the house. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because that's easily, I mean, that could be $10,000 depending on what you put in there. Totally. Um, okay. So 35 is very, very reasonable. And did you renovate the second half where the tenants were in with, between tenants or something? Or do you left that the way it was? We uh, asked the tenants upstairs to leave because they were paying late a lot anyway. Okay. And they left. And then we did just a very, you know, lipstick renovation. But then there was an attic that wasn't finished. Mm -hmm. So we did finish the attic. So it added some square footage to the house. You didn't turn that into like a third unit, did you? No, we weren't quite that ambitious. And it didn't have the access or a bathroom. But it just gave it extra living space. So we were able to rent it a little bit more. Oh, yeah. You added more square footage. Did that increase your property tax? Um, actually, no, I didn't. they did try to reassess us, mm -hmm. but we were able to talk them out of it. I was able to talk them out of it. Nice. Nice. Okay. So that's fantastic. Um, how was property tax up there, by the way? Mm, at the time it what? wasn't great. And I think it's gotten worse. Do you think it's, it's like Massachusetts for a reason? Yeah, probably. I have to, yeah, to look it up. New Hampshire, right. Because of the, the lower taxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Massachusetts is not cheap. Right. So, okay. But you did really, really well. You probably put in like, f let's just say 45 K of your own cash. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then above and beyond that, you made like 160, 170 on top. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you went like four X on your money. Right. In two years. So then I said, huh, real estate. You're like, this oh, is interesting. I'm gonna do this. let's buy another New England 100 year old property. <laughs> no, then I said, we are first, we are leaving. <laughs> I've had enough. Uh, and we are never doing this again. So you went uh, but from then that had bad that had a high tax to a state that has higher tax. Yeah, I didn't do a very good job there. Okay. The problem is San Diego's really nice. And it just it's not a problem. There's a reason why people pay the money. Exactly. You get what you pay for in this instance, but it is expensive.
Right. Okay. Well, that's an amazing story. So that was first property and you exited. And then exited. did you decide to start buying more real estate then at, right then and there or did you take a break? Uh, no, we bought more real estate immediately. So we bought a house in Vegas and okay. then we bought a duplex in Austin. Oh, okay. Uh, and then we just kind of, you know, went from there and I took a breather for med school and residency because that was kind of time consuming. It really interfered right. with my real estate plans. Yeah. Uh, but then once I finished that, as soon as that was done, we got back into it. So was your husband like, where was he as in the gas pedal versus the brake in your real estate journey? He was, he's probably even more aggressive mm -hmm. than I am. And mm -hmm. I'm usually the one putting on the brakes, although he now refuses to do the repairs. Oh, yeah. I've, I've shipped him across the country a few times. and <laughs> he's, uh, he's put his foot down that he is no longer going to be just schlepped out to these properties to fix them. Although he says that, but he just got back from a trip two weeks ago. That's awesome. So um, you bought all these properties and out of state. Mm -hmm. Yes. Were you buying them turnkey or how were you getting these assets? No. So uh, in the beginning, we got them off the MLS. Mm -hmm. But then after their first few, it was obvious that the money just wasn't enough. You know, they right. were too expensive. So then over time, I built up a network of wholesalers and mm -hmm. found, you know, real estate agents who work with investors. So right. almost everything I bought after the first few has all been off market. Okay. Okay. Nice. Um, and you just get like emails from wholesalers all the time and you kind of just filter through mm -hmm. them. All right. Exactly. So how many? Have you, like, emails. Yeah, I know. It's unbelievable how much they get. That's, yeah. that's how they make their money. They just blast emails. So how many uh, do you have in your portfolio now? Right now we have 11. Okay. So like uh, you have a, how many of them are duplexes or multifamily properties versus single families? They're actually right now all single families okay. in, and the only cities we're in right now, we're in Memphis and then in Huntsville, Alabama. Okay. So you said you had 12 properties and they're in how many different cities now? You, you still have Vegas? So 11, 11 properties. Well, Vegas and Austin, we've sold along the way. Okay. Nice. Uh, and then Huntsville and Memphis are the two cities that we're still in. Oh, just those two. And I don't count my, yeah. And I don't count my own home, of course. Cause All right. That's not an investment. You're in San Diego. That's not an investment. I'm in San Diego. Although yeah. it is appreciating, but yeah. it's not an investment. Okay. How is the population growth in San Diego as opposed to like California out of curiosity or the lack of population? Um, it's compared to the rest of California, it's fairly stable. California on the whole. Because the military or? Yeah, the military population here is massive. Yeah. So pretty much everybody here is either in the Navy or, or Marine or they are somehow affiliated with yeah. that. So yeah, it's mostly military and tourism. Yeah. Yeah, you're not as, yeah, it's going to be a lot more stable than the rest of California. Okay. Yeah, it's not like San Francisco at all. Right. I mean, that's. I mean, it's crazy how much uh, have mm -hmm. the exodus of, of, of businesses and uh, capital and people out of San Francisco. Like McKesson, they just moved across the street from me here in Dallas. They literally are mm -hmm. across the street from our office. And McKesson is gigantic, for those who don't know it. It is mm -hmm. probably the biggest healthcare company in the country. Um, and that's just one uh, of many. So, okay. Um, so now you have these. And when did you get into apartment investing so about five years ago um although we were still actively investing you know i realized i didn't want to only be in two cities right but i only have so much time and mm -hmm. i can't necessarily go buy a portfolio of properties in every city that interests me without not being a doctor so then i started looking at you know basically trusting somebody else's expertise like people used to trust mine and started investing in other cities. So then I got into some syndications in the Dallas area uh, and a few others. And that kind of led me down that road because it, it was becoming obvious, not only did I want to be in other cities, but I wanted to scale up. And right. it's very hard to scale up in the single family world. It's, it's doable, lots of people do it, um, but that's, you know, you're creating a whole business on how to find properties and scale up. The medium range, you know, when you get into the 10 to 20 units, it's a very awkward space where the financing is just not as cheap as mm -hmm. the very large complexes and mm -hmm. you don't have the economies of scale. So right. I wanted to find a way to just skip that middle ground and right. jump right to the bigger properties. So yeah. the syndications fit that really well. 
All right. So, um, have you exited any of the Dallas properties that you've gotten, or you're still holding on to them? They're probably going to exit soon. I think they have another year or two to go. Yeah. How how, how many years ago did you buy them? Mm, I think it's been about three years. Okay. So they've done. They probably have done well. They hopefully have done well. We'll see. I mean, yeah. If you got three years ago, and then I mean mm -hmm. the, the cap rates have compressed here favorably. Mm -hmm. If you got within the past two years, it's a little bit less so. But if you got in three years ago, it's probably pretty pretty good. So. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty, that's, that, that's nice. Do you find yourself, um, what, what do you think you're planning to do with it, with the single families that you, you still have? What is a, do you have a long-term plan for these? Yeah. So I bought them with the attention of sitting on them for a really, really, really long time. Cause there are cities that I like. Um, and so far it's working and, really, really Memphis. well and Memphis. Mm -hmm. So I was targeting cities that, you know, the hedge funds and things have not just wiped all the profit out of. Right. But yet still have decent growth mm -hmm. uh, and we're friendly to landlords. And mm -hmm. so far, that's played out really well. Both Memphis and Huntsville have uh, appreciated a surprising amount, although some of that's due to COVID and all the weird things that have happened this year. Uh, and then Huntsville in particular has really popped because the FBI is moving their version of Quantico to Huntsville and Toyota is building this, you know, multi-billion dollar plant just outside of Huntsville. Wow. Okay. So you might I've just been looking for a syndication there for a while, but they yeah. just don't have a lot there yet. Right. It might have to be like a, a new, might have to be like It'd a new development. Be a new It'd be development. Yeah. yeah. Right. All right. Have you invested in it in any development projects? Uh, the hundred year old apartment count as a development project. <laughs> it felt like a development project, but no, I haven't done any development deals yet. I've looked at a few, but I haven't quite, uh, haven't quite gone down that road. Right. Now, do you think your CFA training, um, helps you with analysis in, in real estate? Mm -hmm. I mean, analysis is just analysis. I analyze the patients, I analyze the real estate. It's just taking a problem, breaking it apart into its components parts, figuring out which parts move what, you know, which factors matter, mm -hmm. uh, and then projecting it out, finding the solution, and then reverse engineering. So it's the same principles you can apply to anything. All right, awesome. Um, if there are any audience questions, I'm happy to take them. I should have asked earlier um, because we are approaching an hour here, and uh, I am putting a hard stop when we get to an hour. When we get to an hour, um, okay. Um, I will ask you. Let's see what else before before we wrap this up. Okay, so you are doing this uh, Element Forty One deal with me, mm -hmm. and. Uh, mm -hmm. Syndication wise, uh, is this uh, this is your first time on the on the GP side, right, or on the Correct. on the syndication side? Okay, what um, what things have you, what big things have you learned as uh, on on this side of the fence different than being on an investor? If you could name like a couple things, uh, the couple things is it has definitely burst any bubble I had about the the massive amounts of money. That GPs make while well, they sit in a back room smoking a cigar and sipping sipping port. That is as far away from reality as you can get. It's <laughs> not dissimilar to that hundred year old renovation. Yeah, it's, it's a different it's work. It's a ton of work. It's a ton of work, and a lot of it is not glamorous or exciting or fulfilling. But it's got to get done because the deal's got to get done. Um, and it's not that the GPs don't make good money, but it's it's definitely not what people want it to be. Yeah, you're not just magically creating a million dollars out of nothing. No, no. If it were that easy, um, everybody would just do it, right? Right. Okay. Um, all right. I think we are going to wrap it up for today. Thank you very much. For those... For those of us who don't know how to find you, where do people find you? You can find me at uh, ryca.io. So www at ryca.io. Does that stand for like really young? What is, is there anything exciting? Or is it a secret? No, I just like the sound of it. Oh. Okay. All right. Um, 
All right, so Rika.io, R-Y-C-A.io, Dr. Kathy Carroll. This is episode number 105. We will answer any questions. We'll just answer them offline at this point. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.